the haunting whistle of a Piper Arrow on final approach, and it brings back a hundred memories of the time when this little aeroplane was the Queen of the Skies. She was registered Golf Bravo Bravo Echo Lima, but everybody knew her as Babel, and for eight years she carried us all over Europe and even to North Africa, cruising almost two miles high at 160 miles an hour and 20 miles to the gallon. With full fuel tanks she would be airborne in only 450 yards or so and she could fly for a thousand miles. But this story really began in 1936 when my father joined the Royal Air Force. Here he is at Andover with his Hawker Hind. Of course I wasn't even on the arrivals board at this stage but aircraft were to feature in my earliest memories. My first long trip came when I was 12 from Royal Air Force Aden on the Red Sea back to England in this Hanley Page Hastings, the civil version of the Halifax bomber. But it took another 16 years to get my own pilot's license and three more to qualify as an aero engineer. My first solo was in this air coupe, which, unlike myself, it's still flying. And now we were off. And six months after rescuing this somewhat decrepit tiger moth from the south of France, it looked like this. The occasion was the first of three years flying with the Barnstormers Flying Circus. Oh, and by the way, the tiger moth's still flying too, so I can't have been as bad as I thought. Now the tiger moth was great fun, but it wasn't really suitable for travelling. Enter the Arrow, followed shortly afterwards by a co-pilot. She had a real flair for design, and four months after we started an awful lot of hard work, the arrow looked rather different. My new co-pilot could climb out of an open cockpit looking like this. She was a wonder in the kitchen, still is actually, and best of all, she could remove a prop all by herself. What a woman! I married her straight away before someone else snapped her up. Needless to say, Babel took us on our honeymoon, as well as countless other happy trips. Babel even won over my father, though he had sworn he would never fly again after leaving the RAF over 20 years before. He couldn't get over her performance and comfort. But enough of all that, how does it fly? An aeroplane wing is curved on the top like this, and it's almost flat on the bottom, like this. Air flowing over the curved top of the wing has got a wee bit further to go than the air flowing below it, which can go in a straight line. So the air at the top must travel slightly faster, and increasing the speed of air brings about a reduction in pressure. It's this reduction in pressure that generates lift to support the aircraft. Raising the nose of the aircraft increases the angle at which the wing meets the airstream and so generates more lift, up to a point. Beyond this point the airstream breaks up, the lift decreases and the aircraft's natural stability takes it into a dive until it picks up speed and the smooth airflow is restored. The air actually moves upwards from below the wing to the top, as it does so moving this little vane and closing a switch to operate the stall warning in the cockpit. OK, that's enough theory. This film was originally made for my university students, which is why it records an experience that you're not going to get on EasyJet. We'll tape a series of wool tufts along the wing, then we'll see them lying flat in normal flight, and then we'll reduce speed and see what happens. Let's get airborne. The arrow on sticks in only a couple of hundred yards. Up come the wheels. Well, what's that? All right, come on then. In fact, the arrow accelerates so fast that poor Ivan the cameraman has fired right to the back and can't keep his camera on.
arrow climbed like a rocket, almost a thousand feet a minute and fully loaded, and half as much again with a half load like this. Now let's reduce power, and we'll level out at 3000 feet and 100 knots, and let's see what happens to our wood tufts. Now they're all lying nice and flat, reflecting the smooth airflow at this speed. Just watch the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the first of the wool tufts beginning to show turbulence as the stall approaches. Knots. As the speed comes back, you can see the tufts at the back are getting a bit unhappy and the airflow is starting to break up. Now you'll also notice, if you look along the wing, that as the speed is reduced, the aeroplane's nose is raised higher and higher. Wool tufts show that turbulent stalled air spreading from the inside of the wing to maintain smooth airflow over the control surfaces. About 52 aeroplane puppeting violently and trying to fall out of the stall. And every time we see, we see the tufts fluttering, we feel the whole aeroplane puppet violently. And again, if you look at the horizon, you'll see that the nose is held in a very steep upward attitude. see that the airflow is actually moving forwards at times. The aeroplane is also wallowing about in the sky. It's not really flying. So it's not very happy. Breaking away at the inside of the wing and moving out. And there's the proof that the air uh, under these conditions actually moves forward over the wing. Back in the circuit for landing, I wonder how many times Babel and I flew round Scrabble Tower. Here they are whistling away, it's the wind in the undercarriage. And I can still maintain my view along the runway during the landing. Round the tower again, accelerating up to 200 miles an hour. Little did I know that this is the last low run I would ever make. After 20 years in flying, I was to use my bulldozer and digger experience to start a magazine on heavy plant. Seven days a week, there was no time for Babel or for the hangar. Both were sold. Today I can look back on 20 years of publishing, as well as 20 years in aviation. Babel's still flying in Cambridgeshire. But I've still got my co-pilot. And I've got an awful lot of ha happy memories. Aren't I the lucky boy?